All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I would like to call the March 16th, 2022 regular March meeting of the Fenton Community High School District 100 Board to order. Uh, may I have a roll call? Yes, Figueroa. Here. Hayde. Here. Jalowick. Here. Lewis. Here. Redzinski. Here. Rago. Here. Ting Po Pong. Here, and we have a quorum. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, James, please read our Fenton mission, beliefs, and vice and way statements. Our mission statement, to cultivate successful, passionate, empowered learners through rigor, relevance, and relationships. Our belief statements, successful, passionate, empowered learners thrive when we provide a safe, caring, and welcoming environment. Diversity, equity, and inclusion unify our community. School and home collaborate as one. We champion innovative teaching and engage learning with the state-of-the-art facilities. We infuse social-emotional learning into academics and culture. We prepare students to fulfill their civic responsibility. We immerse students in authentic life experiences. The Bison Way. Students and adults at Fenton High School create a safe, caring, empathetic environment where we believe in each other, respect diversity, communicate openly, grow together and hold each other to high expectation to become the leaders and innovators of the future. Thank you, James. Uh, Mary, we, do we have a request for public comments? No public comments this evening. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go with two recognitions. Sam? Thank you. Good evening. We'd like to get the ball rolling tonight with Dylan Thompson. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kambick. Mr. Kambick, that was his idea. Thank you. Okay, so anyway, Dylan, we're here to celebrate him as a junior this year. He qualified for the IHSA state finals in late January. And just to give you some perspective, in the sectional, 267 pins in one of his games. And we know 300 is a perfect game, so very impressive. I'd like to congratulate his family, who's also here tonight, his sister, also a bowler, two points, two pins away from qualifying, so we hope next year to have both of the Thompsons up here. I hear bowling's quite, quite the thing in the family, so thanks for supporting him tonight. For a little more information, we're going to have uh, Coach Lynch. We'd like to thank Coach Lynch and Coach Chappelle for being here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Benson. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, thank you um, for having us this evening. Um, this bowling season was a, was a tad bit a little difficult here because with all the COVID guidelines and the different, everything that had to go on and, and things, us moving things round and round, you know, it was tough at the beginning not knowing what was going to happen and how we're going to bowl and where we're going to bowl and all of that. And so the season started off a little slow. But a testament to not only Dylan, but the other young men that's on the bowling team, they stuck with it and we stayed in there. On the season, Dylan sees an average, and, and, and when you look at the season average and you look at how everything progressed, you will see how, um, how the season went and why Dylan deserves what he got. His season average was 177. However, when we got to the regional, the regional average was 213. Wow. Now, when I tell you that, we were in the second toughest regional in the state of Illinois, and, and he averaged 213. And his sectional average was 224.5 as we went on. And then as we got downstate in the semifinal round, his average was 202.5. And those averages downstate, they come crashing down because of the atmosphere and everything there. So as you see, because of the way the season started and as it progressed and things got comfortable when we got into it, Dylan kept rolling on. Now Dylan is, on, is the second bowler since 2014 in Fenton High School to qualify for state. And that's two bowlers in the last 12 years and he did a fantastic job. Now I can sit here and talk about um, Dylan all night here 
But really, this night is about Dylan, so I want to introduce Dylan and give him an opportunity to speak. So ladies and gentlemen, Dylan Thompson. I really want to thank my, my family, my coaches, for the opportunity of going to state. It was a tough one this year, but next year we're going for state champ. Hey. 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 Yes, yes. We're going to take a picture real quick if the family wants to step up. Yep. Okay, next up, our speech team. Come on forward. Please announce that the Fenton speech team was sixth in the state this year. And not only that, but there's one big class, so we're competing against schools much bigger than Fenton. So an amazing accomplishment for everyone here. So congratulations. We're going to highlight everyone here tonight, but we're going to start out with our two students that brought home state championships. First is Carissa Lara. As she defended her 2021 state championship, she won first place this year in informative speaking and actually her third state title in two years. And she also won sixth place in poetry reading. Just, to, just for, there we go. We also want to highlight Evelyn Perez, who won first place in state this year in special occasion speaking. We were able to celebrate these accomplishments at a uh, school-wide assembly on March the 3rd, in which they performed their state winning uh, speeches, which was outstanding, flawless. Right? That's how I felt, but anyway, it was a great example of what can happen if you put your mind to it, take the instruction that's given to you, and dream big. And I think that's a great message for all of our kids to see. So we are more than happy to uh, have those assemblies. I'd also like to highlight Carolina Rosas, who won third place in humorous interpretation. Sochi Quinones qualified and competed in radio speaking and original oratory events. And finally, the performance in the round, the day the crayons came home. Uh, that's right. And you're kind of in the, in the stage, round. yeah, right. Because on stage, they did surround the audience, so we're kind of trying to do that here, right? Okay, I'm just gonna announce your names just to highlight uh, your, your state performance. Aldo Benitez, Alexa Calderon, Solny Colas, Suigi Mirandez Garcia, Layla Morales, Dylan Orlick, Angeline Munoz Meredia, Tara Pabico, <laughs> Phoebe Reyes, Morgan Tatella, and Julia Windham. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now I'm going to turn it over to Coach Hendricks, Coach Feinberg, and Molly O'Connor. But before we do that, I, I, I must say, seven state championships in four years does not happen by accident. So I think we need a big round of applause for our coaches. <laughs> Soak that up for a little bit. <laughs> Thank you for saying all of the names too. Sure. Um, we are so, so very proud of this team. This is the most that we've advanced in speech indiv individual events and performance in the round in quite a long time. Um, so 15 students attending speech down in Peoria uh, um, just at the end of February. And one of the things that we always uh, work with our students to understand is that our sectional uh, like you heard uh, Mr. Lynch say too, our sectional for speech is one of the hardest in the state. There are six. And from our sectional at state, seven of the 14 individual events champions were from our sectional. Wow. So they were represented <laughs> just yeah. from our sectional. So they really, uh, we compete with the best and you know, just because we're a small school that doesn't get in our way at all, we like to compete with the best at our regular tournaments too. So we're so very proud of these students. Um, many of our students, as you know, uh, through the pandemic have faced individual difficulties as well, some with health issues, some, you know, and they kept going. And one of the things that they always have is this persistence and desire to continue to lead. And then one of the other things that I see too is that they continually support students from other teams. And that's a kind of a culture that we like to cultivate because they often go off to college and make friends with those students around them too. Um, for Carissa Lara, who is coached by myself and Ms. Feinberg in her events uh, this year and in previous years, we're absolutely proud of her and the young speaker that she's become. She's polished more so than at this point, I think I am. Uh, I'm out of practice, she's definitely in practice. And she knows how to not only organize a strong poetry program with a common theme, but then also to organize an informative on the topic of tea. If there's anything you'd like to know about tea, Carissa Lara can spill the tea <laughs> for you. Yes. Uh, she's got that going for her. And so to have those three titles, as well as to play six in state in poetry, I mean, there's just, uh, I, just I don't know how, how you could do any more anything more than Chris Alara. So I'd like to take a moment, step aside, and let Carissa speak, and then, and then discuss Evelyn a little bit, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Hi, um, thank you. I think I owe a lot of my success to my coaches over here, and they're the ones who like continuously push me to, to work my hardest, because they know everything that I can do, and them and my parents, they're the ones who always teach me to work the hardest. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, moving on to Evelyn Perez, another senior. We are going to miss uh, leaving this year, but then also um, just enjoy that she's gonna move on to the next chapter of her life as well. Um, Evelyn Perez taking first in special occasion speaking. Uh, Evelyn has always brought a wonderful sense of humor to <laughs> the acting events. Um, you've probably seen her in shows here as well as in choir, um, as involved as Carissa is too. And uh, she's always been, we've had her um, in many, many events over the years, but she really found her home in special occasion speaking where we shape a message for a specific audience. And this year she shared a message on structural uh, gaslighting and um, actually shared it for an audience that was her family as well as how we can sometimes do these things within our own family structures and how we must fight against them. And she provides some, some examples for us too. And peppering it in with a little humor. So when we got to see that at the awards assembly, it was lovely because we actually got to hear a much larger audience laugh and enjoy with her and maybe be a little surprised that um, she was related to her friend Erica. We like to throw in names from our community as well, even if it's not the case. Um, but Evelyn uh, was coached by Melissa Feinberg in special occasion speaking. <coughs> so proud of these, uh, not only the competitors, but the coach as well. They just have such a great relationship. So I'd like to turn it over to Evelyn so that she can, oh, and both of them have been four year members. I forgot to mention that. Um, here is um, Evelyn to say a few words as well. Hi, well first I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity and recognition. 
And then kind of going off of what Carissa said, I'd like to thank my amazing coaches for pushing me so far and encouraging me to try my best always. Um, as well as my team members, my family, my friends, and anybody else who supported me along the way. It's been an amazing four years, and I can't wait to see what this speech team will accomplish in the future. Okay, gonna take a picture. Would you use your back there? Yeah. Well, okay, well, yeah, that's a good idea. Why don't we come back here? Is the lighting good? Okay, well, that was fun. Um, so next, uh, we normally go to informational items, but uh, this evening we're gonna go to our discussion items and action items. So we are gonna vote on this tonight. Um, so we have a resolution providing for and requiring the submission of the proposition of issuing school, building bonds to the voters of the district at June uh, 28, 2022 general primary election. Uh, the next agenda item for the board is consideration of a resolution providing for and requiring the submission of the proposition of issuing school building bonds to the voters of the district at the general primary election to be held this coming June 28, 2022. The resolution sets forth the following proposition to be submitted to the voters of this district. Shall the Board of Education of Fenton Community High School District number 100, DuPage County, Illinois, improve the site and renovate, alter, repair, and equip the Fenton, bless you, Fenton High School building, including installing school safety and emergency response systems and equipment, repairing and replacing ventilation, plumbing, and electrical infrastructure, increasing classroom capacity, improving classroom lighting and technology, renovating programming and career learning spaces, mitigating indoor flooding with drainage improvements, increasing accessibility with uh, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, compliance measures, and issue bonds of said school district to the amount of 129.7 million for the uh, pur purpose of paying the cost thereof. Uh, let me repeat that, it's 129,700,000. Um, may I have a motion and a second to adopt this resolution? I'll make that motion. Second. Uh, may I have a roll call, please, Mary? Rigo? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, 
one moment, please. Um, is, is there any board discussions after this motion? Uh, moved to second. So is there any discussions along the way here? Yeah, We've, we yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. We my, po my apologies there. Yeah, for the public purpose. Yeah. yeah. I, I just want to cut that off and, and, and do that. Sure. I would recommend that a, a, a co-chair of the finance committee, possibly, uh, and uh, that's that's you, John, and, and Carrie, to summarize uh, what took place at the finance committee meeting. If you feel comfortable, oh, no, I can take I, a shot absolutely. at it. Absolutely. Um, this has been being reviewed and discussed starting with our school survey for almost two years now, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Um, we've had all our public meetings. We, we've gone out and heard what the public had to say. We've had multiple committee meetings. We've had the finance committee meetings. We had a presentation that went a full hour prior to this meeting. Uh, if you really want to be excited, you can watch that. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's somewhere out there on the web. But it, it, in not making light of this is very important. We've been trying to do our due diligence. We've been trying to be visible. We've been trying to listen to what the voters, what the taxpayers, what the students, what the staff all had to say about what needed to be done at a school. And we've decided on what we as a board seem to think is the best way to move forward to, to assist the school in being better, to, to allow us to better serve our students, to improve our spaces, to make the school safer, to address flooding issues without overdoing it, because there were things that the public said we shouldn't do, and those items have been removed from the list of things that we're doing. We've adjusted the price accordingly. We're doing everything in our due diligence to make this as least painful as possible to our taxpayers. There's been hours and hours of discussion and research and, and consideration made to what we're about to pass now. So anybody who may just be watching tonight for the first time, this is just the end of part one. Because once we pass this, if it should pass, we start part two. And that's the campaigning. And then part three, the final act, is the construction. So there's still a long road ahead of us. But there's been a ton of research and, and, and consideration and dialogue from everyone in the districts had the opportunity. And for everyone who participated, uh, I want to say thank you personally, because this is a huge decision. But it's the right decision, and it's a long overdue decision. And I'm not throwing that at anybody in the past. It's not an easy undertaking but we can't delay this any further. This needs to be addressed. Um, questions, comments, concern, call James. <laughs> <laughs> would, would, any, would every board member like, like to make a comment since we've gone through this? Maybe just one, uh, just a, a limited comment, just to say the process and all that. That might help the, the general public and the community to hear from us. Would that be a good idea? If they want. <laughs> Well, did, oh. Kerry, well, did Kerry yeah. have something that he wanted to add? I thought you were about to say something. He was, John was pretty thorough in all the items that has taken place up through now as far as the necessity and discussions held throughout the high school and the district and the community that led up to this decision. Yeah, and I would, I would encourage if, if um, the public's listening uh, and just caught this at the tail end of it to, to go through uh, the different um, meetings that are on, online and, and really do research on this. I, I, I think um, I can say personally that I'm really proud of this board for going through this process, um, doing the due diligence, you know, considering that we are uh, ourselves community members, members that are going to also see these uh, these tax uh, rates. Um, I, I think I can speak for us when we, we say that this is an investment towards the community. And, um, you know, we didn't do it lightly. And uh, we'll still have to vote on this this evening as well, as well as uh, look ahead towards the vote in the legislation process, right? So, um, anything else, you guys? Okay, without further ado then, um, let's go ahead and uh, get that motion again and then second, if, we, if it's, it's okay. We don't, we don't have to, call. okay. Then we'll, we'll just do roll call. Rigo? Yes. Figaro? Yes. Katie? Yes. Jalwood? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Rezinski? Yes. Pink Ball Palm? Yes. Uh, then we, we have the vote passed. Uh, <laughs> Mr. 
President, I just wanted to comment um, on how happy and passionately uh, we are grateful to the board. Um, just real quickly, our kids deserve this. Our future kids deserve this. The city of Wooddale and Bensonville deserve this. We're going to move in the right direction, um, and you will see the payoff for our new facilities in the near future. But again, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for approving this motion. And, and I do want to emphasize that you know, this is just the start, right? right. We know yeah. that, that there will be a lot more time for community involvement for them to come in and see what is going to be done. And so Absolutely. There's an educational campaign. And certainly encourage anyone um, that has any questions to come in and take a tour of the building, uh, speak with James. If they have any questions, uh, you could also come and speak to any any of us. Um, but certainly come and take a look at the building, take a tour of the building, so that you can see exactly what needs to be done. Okay, great. Let's go through certified staffing plan. Uh, the certified staffing plan of 2022 and 2023. Um, James, sure. Real quickly, uh, next slide. Uh, the staffing plan is here, has been revised by a slight point two margin. The, um, the attachment uh, that you received in the packet at 111.1, uh, it should be 111.3. Uh, we added an extra section. But let me just go for you. We got uh, a couple new members here, uh, board members here, but just wanted to explain what is a staffing plan, next slide, and its purpose. The staffing plan is the total number of certified staff members needed for a school year to teach and provide student services. It's basically saying, hey, look, board, this is the number of teachers we need for next year to make sure all of our students are educated. Number two, why do we need a staffing plan? The staffing plan is needed to ensure course and student service positions are covered for the students who are placed into courses for their academic year. It reflects on number one. These are the individuals we need to make sure we have a very effective uh, school year uh, next year. And how does it affect our students? The staffing plan is, is the plan of all courses students take in the coming school year. How, does, how do we create the staffing plan? This is a couple months worth of work. It starts in December, where all the students select the courses they would like for the next year. That's step one. Step two, January and February, our counselors meet with individual students to make sure they have the courses they need to graduate and to consult them as well. Uh, by February, our division leaders and principal meet to discuss the number of requests, course enrollment trends, and numbers of section needed for the school year. This is when we kind of fine tooth it. Hey, look, this class only has two, two, two students. We're probably not gonna run this class and so forth. Number four, in February and March, Principal Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources and the creator of, uh, and the, creator of the master schedule meet to finalize the building-wide tentative staffing plan. So we take these hundreds of uh, course selection and put it in a plan in periods one, periods two, periods three, and so forth. It's quite complicated. And lastly, in March, we bring this plan to you for approval, and that's what we're doing this evening. So we take a look at this again. Um, it's the right-hand corner, bottom number, 111.3. Uh, that's the number of individuals we would need here. We call it FTE, full-time equivalent. Um, just looking at the trend from last year, we're down two. Um, individuals there, um, and that's because our, and that specifically our special ed numbers are down, uh, but we're pretty much averaging about 111, 112, 110 uh, um, in regards to the numbers of FTE. I'll stop there for any questions before we go to, the, for the recommendation to pass this motion. Could you explain the decimal points or sure. 2.8? Sure, I'm going to turn you know, that over. Half to teach you yeah, or the yes, there you go. <clears throat> Jose, would you like to take that question? Why is there a point three there? Sure. Those are uh, so that each section. Let's say you have a an English class, you know, so it would be point one for first semester and point two for sec or point one for second semester. So it's all together, it's a point two. If that makes sense. So a teacher, a regular teacher, is teach is a one point zero because they're teaching five classes. They have two preps and then they have a lunch period. So that is a regular. Uh, day for a teacher along with bison time. So that's kind of how that's that's um, established. So we, we look at, you know, the, the size of the classes, 
um, what types of classes are being taught, and then determine how many teachers we need uh, for each subject matter. So, point three, when you first turn first, yes. is it one point, is it Correct. Right, and I, I, let's say you teach, you know, yeah, it, it's just, that's just the best way to describe it is it's like a section of a, of a, of a class. Yeah, point one. Or perhaps someone teaches a little extra when we do the extra. The overload. The overload, that's so then it's, they might be a 1.2 for right. that semester. That's not to, ideal though. Yeah, but it's yeah. not <laughs> ideal, but it is, it is a possibility. Correct, mm -hmm. correct. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it's good to point out that this is, this is driven by student interest. Student interest as well as student enrollment. Yeah. Right. Uh, so it's driven by that. And then um, if, if let's say a, a, a class or a curriculum is not offered this semester of their student interest the following year, following semester, then we would fill uh, that need as well. Yes, is that depending correct? on, yeah, we have an increase. Let's say a ton of kids decide to take one particular uh, elective, then that would change the number of sections for that elective. Uh, I, I, I'm a little concerned about the, the, this continued decrease of the <clears throat> math teachers. Um, because math, math seems to be one of our not strongest <clears throat> um, strengths, but one of our best strengths in our school. And I, I, I'm concerned that we're I think that that's a good question. Um, math is very important, just like the rest of the classes. We are not underserving our student. It's really uh, uh, the demand for that class um, and the number of students per class. Um, and it's also, uh, Michelle, if you were, could you help me out on this one? The requirement for math is it's two or three years a requirement. It's what do students normally choose in regards to that? Three year requirement, they usually choose four. Four. Yeah. But I think it's, it's, you know, sure. I think, yeah. so we added point four sections of math, mm -hmm. um, kind of pandemic related. Uh, so the reality is we, we were kind of doing on some smaller class size compression, but the way things looked at this year, we didn't necessarily have to do that again. So we did not have to do Yeah. For this year, we did all this for, for math, it was, we're down point four. Right. So that's what I'm saying. Those, that point four was added in sort of pandemic related, and so um, when we did the section, we did not need that point four. Yeah. Okay, I'm but trying to provide. Point four, but we also lost a whole, you know, one of my own, you know. Sure. Okay. But I, I just explained the de the decrease um, right. in math for, for this year. Right. I think there's a trend there as well. As you look at further left, there's a ten point two. That's our sweet spot, Patty. I think we put in some extra buffers uh, um, the last couple of years. And also a, a factor that we all know, the enrollment is, is not a decline like this. It's, it's kind of like a slow decline. When I started here, it was like 1575. We're at, the, at about 1475 right now. So we know that's happening. Once again, it's, it's um, I just want to make sure the board understand we are not taking classes away. Right? If there is enough students requesting for that class, whether it's for science, for example, EP biology or EP psych, and we have that critical number um, for that class, we run that class. We are not taking programs away. We, we've reiterated that even during the pandemic, we added programs and beefed it up. Uh, what we've done last year, especially for the learning loss of our students with that pandemic, we added more teachers and we added more programs as well. Just as long as we're not relying heavily on the computer for mathematics that's and not teachers that's, instruction yeah that's what i but it's hands on instruction there's correct. Not computers. correct um I, you know just personally for me i would i would i would like to see us be more of a stem school um but i i realize that it, it's just student guide i mean student preference and interest that's driving this right so it's every year you've got to class of students that come in that uh, demonstrate either a, an interest, a passion, or uh, you know an aptitude for something, that's what they drive, is kind of going through these. And that's where we fill in where the instruction has to be. Mm -hmm. So. 
the other thing that happened the other thing that happened in math is we we uh, somewhat detract in our general classes so before there was always um, this general course and then there was like a re not a remedial but a course where students who performed lower were tracked into these lower courses and we detract that and all students enter into our math one math two so we're not um, denying anybody opportunity to that grade level instruction um, it wasn't necessarily off grade level but it would take some students two years to get through an algebra curriculum instead of one. Um, so we, we did a little work on that, which when you collapse certain amount of sections like that, you, um, you kind of, the, the, the need for as many sections reduces. Um, the type of pedagogy we use doesn't dictate the amount of students we put into a classroom. And that's how we determine how many sections are needed. So I just want to be clear that has mm -hmm. nothing to do with whether they're on the computer or whether you know, they're taught directly, mm -hmm. but our students have moved to a pedagogy that's problem-based in nature, mm -hmm. so that's more of that STEM. I'm not just learning a skill and over and over repeating that skill. I am actually applying that skill in real-world situations. So I just want to kind of clarify some of those sure. questions and comments on that end. You said everybody answers in the same. Ex uh, unless it's accelerated, we just we took away that that lower track. Yeah. What student services like? What are those classes? What is student services? Student services is counselors, uh, oh. psych, social worker. Oh, okay. So, would it, would, is it is it a is it a correct explanation at all that even if we see a reduction in instruction level that it could be due to instruction efficiency at all? Where, you know, maybe we have more tools than before that helps us teach better? Is that a, a fair statement at all? Or? Okay. Yeah, I mean, our students are collaborating together. They're pro solving problems together. They're mm -hmm. working with their teachers on solving these problems. They're also filling in and establishing um, or remediating skill deficits, which we've seen plenty of after mm -hmm. the pandemic, um, in a more individualized digital manner. So you're seeing a combination of both, um, but we definitely are leaning into problem solving and problem-based mathematical instruction. Hmm. But we, we have to have tools that allow us to remediate the gaps and meet students where they're at. And mm -hmm. you can't always expect a teacher sitting in front of 27 teacher to individual, or 27 students to individualize for all 27 students. You have to have some digital tools to help yeah. with that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where that piece mm -hmm. comes into play. Right, a little bit of efficiency but, and quality, correct? Right, Keeping but the quality. It, still, it still doesn't have a direct impact on these okay. numbers. Okay. We're not changing the amount of students that go into a classroom based on our pedagogy. And, and just for my understanding, these are our teachers here in our building. Yes. Uh, looking ahead to 7.E, you know, this is an additional math class, but those are going to be Elmhurst instructors, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So that's another set of people teaching. And then everybody at TCD are getting instructors that are outside of Fenton, so they're not in our staffing plan. And I think that plays into the STEM side and the trade side as well. So we got to remember that we have other resources that aren't directly ours. So the number might seem lower, but when you look at the big picture taking into Elmhurst next year and TCD, there's other avenues that we got to remember we have by our other agreements. Right. Absolutely. Just to point out too, let's take a look at family consumer science. Popular class, right? Popular class. Yeah. Look where it was a couple years ago at four, and it went to three. Now it's at 4.9. Kids want to take that class. A couple years ago, if you look at English language learners with our influx of immigrants, it was at 6.8. We are at nine, nine at house. So we react to the trends. We are react to enrollment. Um, but an, another good point there, John, TC, we got to take that in mind as well as NEDSEC and all the other programs we have oh, to yeah, service our students. The, I think the bottom line uh, that I know this is numbers, a numbers game here, and if you treat it that way, but really behind the scene is providing the right services for our students. Any other questions, you guys? Uh, so uh, regarding the certified staffing plan for 2022-23, may I have a 
uh, motion? I'll make to that pass. motion. Okay. Second. second. Okay. Thank you. Roll call, please. I'm, I'm sorry. I, did you mention that there's a revised standing plan? Yeah. yeah, he read it. I, I can read it again. Uh, may I have a motion that the Board of Education adopt the revised staffing plan for 2022-2023 as presented. Thank you, Mary. And I'll still make the motion. Second. Thank you very much. Rigo? Yes. Hey. Yes. Jowell? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Redzinski? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. King Paul Pong? Yes, and motion passed. Uh, next, we go to the resolution abating the working cash fund, and uh, Bruce. That is me, yes. yes. Um, you have a resolution before you tonight. Um, the primary purpose of the working cash fund is, is to loan any fund for which taxes are levied, monies, uh, when or if necessary, and after formal approval by the Board of Education. So it's kind of your internal bank, if you will. Um, when the budget was adopted last September, um, we had planned for this transfer um, abatement, I should say, partial abatement. Um, the, the transportation fund, we've struggled a little bit in that fund with um, having uh, adequate funds uh, to operate the fund without some additional support from other funds. Um, so we have, overall, our fund balance is strong. Uh, the working cat, or the transportation fund, rather, has is, is, is been a, a, a little bit light on reserves. So uh, we have the working cash fund to help uh, support that fund um, as, as we're showing it tonight. The part of what's driving that is there's really two funding sources, um, which is not a surprise, but in this fund in particular, it's property taxes, which is about 78%, close to 80% of the revenues, which is consistent with what our funding sources are across the board. We also get state transportation aid, so about 20% of that is transportation from the state. That has not been consistent, it's been prorated, it's been reduced, um, and that's been kind of hurting our need to operate that fund. Um, so when we levy, um, you know, we're, we're, we try to be thoughtful about you know, where you're gonna levy the funds because if you levy higher in one fund, it impacts other funds. So you've gotta kind of play a little bit of a balancing act. I think what'll happen in the fall with the um, levy being, uh, and the CPI as high as it is, we'll be able to levy higher in the transportation fund and hopefully support that fund stronger than it's been in the, in the past couple of years. Um, so anyhow, that's kind of a long-winded story for this resolution tonight, this partial abatement. Um, again, as, as I said, it's been budgeted, was budgeted when we passed the budget back in September, um, and we're asking the board to act on that tonight, but I'll certainly answer any questions if, that you may have. No questions. Okay. And that picture there is that it's not the number of buses we have. That's quite yeah. a fleet. Yes. <laughs> we, we are one of the very few districts that brand do new. have a fleet. That's true. That's true. So. Some shiny new okay, so I may have a motion that the Board of Education adopt the resolution abating the working cash fund as presented. So, so moved. Second. Okay, uh, may I have a roll call, please? Yes. Rago? Yes. Jowlis? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Redzinski? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Kay? Yes. King Paul Pong? Yes. And a motion passed. Yeah, next uh, order of business is Elmhurst University MOU, mm -hmm. and that would be yep. Michelle, Ms. Popnikoff. Of course. So we, we, we previewed this a little bit last month. Um, Elmhurst University wants a partner in Fenton, and we want a partner in Elmhurst University. We've been seeking out collegiate partners for a while now to help our students earn early college credit. So um, this memorandum of understanding um, is one that they call the Collegiate Extension Program, and they offer it to a couple of other districts in our area, and they've found success with it. Um, they informed us about it, we learned about it, we talked directly with their dean, we talked directly with their professors, and um, it looks like a very strong option for our students. 
Um, we call it dual enrollment. They call it collegiate extension program, but that dual enrollment, once again, was a professor from the college teaching the course and then getting the students getting a credit through the college, them being a registered member of that college or a registered student of that college while still being a registered student of the high school. Whether we decide to issue credit is totally up to us. We learned with our experience with U of I, it might be better that we just leave that off of our transcripts for our students and let them take um, their university credit with them wherever they decide to go after high school. It is a flat fee per course. Um, they do not want us to charge tuition per student like we did with the University of Illinois. They had a really hefty um, tuition rate um, for us. They want us to um, come to an agreement. Um, it's $3,500 for the course for as many students who enroll. Oh. So if we have two or if we have 20 or if we have 40, it's that flat fee of $3,500. Mm -hmm. um, the um, scholarships for students that are incorporated into this agreement, agreement, if a student completes this course, whichever course it is, for right now we're talking about Calculus 3, um, and then, then they decide to enroll as um, a long-term student at Elmhurst, they will get $2,000 a year off of their tuition. Obviously, that's an incentive for them to help <laughs> increase their yes. enrollment. Um, uh, like I said, this will be for Calculus 3 during the 22-23 school year, um, but they are definitely open to other courses in the future, um, whether it's their freshman college algebra or freshman college English, um, which we have to work out. But for now, um, Calculus 3 fits our needs because right now our numbers are fairly low. Um, over the next two years, we probably have about 15 to 20 students who are actually eligible to take that class and whether they actually decide to enroll is another story. So for us to actually staff a class like that with our own people, it's not gonna make sense. Um, so this provides us an opportunity to let them continue with their math studies if they so wish in that direction. Do um, you have We have a couple. Um, we have probably a few more that can take it, but they've been waiting to see what we do <laughs> with this. Um, so uh, I, I think once, if you decide to approve this motion and we make the adjustment to our course catalog, um, our students will be reintroduced to this course and to see if they want to enroll. Versus Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Is it in person or online? So it's online, um, but they have an instructor who actually Zooms with the class. Okay. So there's a couple of different online formats. Um, the one we were using with U of I was like correspondence. They're doing the problems and there's a guide on the side. If oh. they access yeah. them, this is more, there's a teacher actually getting on a Zoom with them. So it's a synchronized class. Yeah, thank you. That's a good, yes. that's a good term for it, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the term. I have, we haven't used that asynchronous <laughs> synchronous word, in a yeah. while. <laughs> Going back to our hybrid days, yes, yeah. that's exactly it. Uh, mm -hmm. So is it like during this school day? Yeah, we ha we'll have to figure out how and where to schedule that um, to ensure that the students have some space in their schedule to actually participate. Um, but we've done, we, we did that again with the, the class this year. So. Would, would our kids be going with other college kids or just? Uh, um, Actually, in this scenario, they'd be going with other high school students okay. from the surrounding area. Mm -hmm. Same program. Same program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there may or may not be college students in it, because I don't think they uh, deny a, another student access, but um, I, I, when, in our discussions with them, they were talking about us collaborating with 99 or 88 mm -hmm. and, and, and using that model. <laughs> Oh no. Listen, these are students that are going to some of our most selective colleges in the country and they can do anything, <laughs> I think. Um, <laughs> but yes, um, in talking to the professor at Elmhurst, he feels really confident that the students have found success in this model even before the pandemic. They were using an online format, so he, he feels confident that it works. Um, and uh, it, 
Well, yeah, I mean. So, so there's there's probably some uh, uh, you know outside support as far as maybe. You know, yeah, well, yeah, we'll office do office hours. Yeah, they they also ask us to provide some support on our end. So you know, with our math lab, and mm -hmm. you know, if we have any certified support interventionists. They, yeah. We will assign the students to um, get the extra support that they need also here at, at mm -hmm. Fenton. You know, as much as I hate to say this, as, as much as we're leery of the computer, this is all the kids know. They're more comfortable with it than we'll ever be. Uh, as aggravating I'll, as that is. <laughs> I'll, I'll say this, Patty. Haven't taken Calc 1, 2, and 3. Uh, uh, 2 is much harder. <laughs> much harder. But, um, yeah, I, I, would, I wouldn't know if I could have taken Calc 3 online but uh, to john's john's point um it's a different interface that i was probably not used to yeah until now. so we'll see we'll see there's a lot more tools that are yeah. used by teachers who are instructing online we just had a training for some folks on project-based learning and they got an email here are all the different tools we will use during this online training and there were eight of them <laughs> so it wasn't just zoom it was this tool and that tool and how to, how to chat with one another it was it's, I've, it's amazing i've taken all three there was no internet when i took it so i can't really speak to how can't to speak to it me. yeah well <laughs> <laughs> well and, and, and <laughs> Well, this sounds like a way better option than what we got from U of I for oh. way less money. Yeah. Do the, do yeah. the credits, if, let's say they go through, do the credits roll over? To, do they pass over to another college if they so, decided so, to change? Yeah, so what they get at the end of this is a, is a university transcript that yeah. says they've completed this course. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And that can transfer to any other university they may decide to go to. A D gets full credit. A D gets full credit. Mm -hmm. A D gets full credit. I mean, that's that's, that's kind of class. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, are we satisfied? Um, uh, so, uh, as far as the the Elmhurst University MOU uh, may have a motion that the Board of Education approves the Fenton High School District 100 and Elmhurst University Institutional Partnership Collegiate Extension Program Memorandum of Understanding. Second. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, may I have a roll call, please? Roll call. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about Kelp, so. <laughs> I was going to take a pass. <laughs> yes. 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 And motion passed unanimously. Um, uh, next is our course catalog amendment uh, due Elm Elmhurst uh, University MOU. Okay, so this is the follow-up to ensure shot. that our students understand what's being offered to them. So in our course catalog, we'll revise um, our Calculus three course description. Um, it will indicate that it's an online course taught by an Elmhurst University professor. It talks about how um, you must earn a D or a better to earn the credit. Um, and the prerequisite um, of a B or better, an AP Calc BC, um, which is a little bit different also than the prerequisite for U of I. They had to earn a four or a five on the actual AP exam. This is actually what they earn in their performance during oh, the class. Cover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm proposing a motion that we accept those amend that amendment in the course catalog so we can advertise it accurately to students. Comments, questions? Otherwise, we'll speed this along. Okay. Uh, may I have a motion that the Board of Education approves the proposed amendment to the 2022-2023 Fenton High School course catalog as presented? So moved. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Patty. Roll call, please. Reagan? Yes. Reagan? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Hayes? Yes. Jalwood? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Tim Paul Yes, motion passed. Uh, we go through the 2022-2023 NEDSEC classroom lease agreement. That would be James. Perfect. Uh, and that is actual picture of our NEDSEC classroom. <laughs> so, um, oh, and I had my notes here. Real quick, this is an annual lease agreement with NEDSEC, which stands for North DuPage Special Education Cooperative. We lease one classroom to NEDSEC for 15000 per year. This program is currently servicing 10 Fenton students. 
The program is called Academic Life Skills Program and it serves students who are eligible for special education and require an educational environment with intensive programming. The program provides individualized intervention to support students across academics, communication, motor, social, behavioral, daily living skills, and pre-vocational and employment domains. The focus is, to nurture, is, is on nurturing the growth of the whole child by fostering independence throughout their learning process. The staff in this program are NEDSEC employees, not Fenton. We are very happy with this program here at Fenton and the services NEDSEC is providing. We recommend that the Board of Education renews the NEDSEC classroom lease agreement because it's very useful, not just for the students, but for their families who need the service. Uh, do you want to remind the public again what NEDSEC stands for? Sure. It stands for North DuPage. Mm, I wrote it down. North DuPage. I wrote it down, didn't I? Here it is. North DuPage Special, Special Education, Education. Co Education Cooperative. Well, cooperative. It's a co-op. Okay. And this ties it to our student services, right? This is ties it? to our student services. Okay. One of the so programs we brought. Per year to use that classroom. <clears throat> okay. Um, then we will take a vote. May I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the NEDSEC lease agreement as presented? I'll make, I'll second. Uh, thank you, Patty. Thank you, John. Um, Rago? Yes. Roll, please, yeah. Figueroa? Yes. Abe? Yes. Galwood? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Redzinski? Yes. Tinkwopong? Yes, and motion passed. Uh, notice of non-renewals and dismissals, honorable dismissals, Jose. Yeah, so we have uh, a few staff members that um, will be dismissed uh, primarily due to sectioning, uh, reduction of sections uh, for next school year. I'm sorry, you said due to what? Reduction of sections, the number of sections that we just, that, that conversation we just went over earlier about the number of staff. No questions, then uh, may I have a motion that the Board of Education adopt the resolutions and notices of non-renewal and dismissal, honorable dismissal as presented. And these are honorable dismissals. This isn't on them. This is just because we restructured. So no, no penalty on them when they reapply somewhere. Uh, for the most part. Okay. For the most part, yeah. What, what, do you want to go back to questions again? Do you want, let's go over that real quick. So we have some non-honorable. I, I didn't catch that. There, there's a, there's two, there's honorable dismissal and there's a dismissal as well. Just a straight dismissal. Yes, okay. sir. I know we don't want to get into a public. Day. I just want, I may, I missed that. I just wanted to clarify. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. So uh, may have a motion um, that uh, the board of education adopt the resolutions and notices of non-renewal and dismissal, honorable dismissal as presented. I got it. Thank you. So moved. I'll second. Okay, thank you, Juliet and John. Can I get a roll call? Rago? Yes. Abe? Yes. Galwood? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Redzinski? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Tinkwell Pong? Yes. Motion passed. Next is the uh, certified <laughs> summer school Jose. MOU. Jose. Yes, uh, this is uh, one of the things we discussed at our last meeting. Uh, we were trying to clarify uh, language in the contract for staff um, when it comes to summer school, who would be chosen, who would be selected to teach. Oh, yeah. uh, specifically, so if you look, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. We have the original contract language that had three different you know, points of, of who would get uh, chosen. And if you look at the new language, uh, the next slide, please. Um, we have a, a two sections. We have an A and a B. The A would be for a regular class, like a math, English, science, history class. The B would be for credit recovery like specific, specifically because pretty much anybody with a teaching certification can teach credit recovery. Um, but we want to make sure that everyone is aware, there's, no, there's clarity, there's no uh, confusion as to who should be you know, teaching the class or who would, you know, why they're being chosen to teach the class. So we're hoping that going forward for 
future teachers and future administrators, this is very clear in the language, in the contract, in terms of who's chosen and why. Yes, the past. right. So we try to reward people that have been doing it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So based on seniority, yes. pretty much. Okay. Okay. If no further questions, uh, may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the certified summer school MOU as presented? So motion. Second. Yep. Thank you, Carrie and uh, Sylvia. <laughs> Can I get a roll call? Yes. Rago. Yes. Jalwood? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Redzinski? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Hayes? Yes. Tinkopong? Yes. Motion passed. And uh, so that's all the um, voting items. Uh, let's get to informational names. Fantastic. The next four items there, the amendment budget 2021, the Chromebook purchase, the summer school curriculum hours, the extended employment, are all FYIs that will be voted on next board meeting. So this is a chance for you to reflect on it as uh, the different presenters uh, present on this item. Then the following, the Bell Schedule Exploration, that's exactly what it is. We're just exploring, it's in its neophyte stage. We, Michelle's gonna talk about that a little bit later and the COVID update. So with that, let's go to the informational item. These, once again, are FYI, so you have some background knowledge, so you have that information when you vote on it. Uh, next board meeting. The first one is amendment budget, and that's Bruce. And that uh, we're uh, recommending that the amended budget be brought forward, uh, and we'll present it to the board at the April board meeting. And that's for this year. Uh, part, we normally try not to do this, but because it's been kind of a odd year, I guess, with grants and ESSER grants and title grants, and with the changes, um, our food service program, our corporate personal property replacement taxes are trending far higher. So we want to align that better with how we're tracking. Um, we still expect to have a balanced budget, but this would uh, allow us the opportunity to, to track it more to what our, uh, how the activity is occurring throughout the year. So the process is the same as adopting the original budget. You, know, you have to uh, you know, act on a, uh, the budget initially, in this case, the amended budget. Um, it goes on display. You, know, you have the 30 days notification, you have a hearing and we anticipate uh, acting on that in June then um, to act on the, and approve the, have the hearing that evening and the adoption of the budget, the amended budget at that board meeting in June, so. So it's primarily about the food service? Or food service, the grants, ESSER grants, and the title grants, and some revenue issues as well with the corporate, corporate personal property replacement taxes, which are trending far higher, which is great, <laughs> but far uh, greater than uh, we had expected. So the state's been uh, fairly generous this year with the, uh, those taxes and how they're coming in. So there's a, a nice question. change. Yeah, so there's a yeah. question of where we need to spend the money? <laughs> Pardon me? It, it, yeah. Well, it, it, where we're going to spend it? Yeah, yeah. yeah it'll, it'll just align better with how we're tracking, I think, the budget. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. Jim, Chromebook purchase, exciting. <laughs> last, uh, this will be the third year that we've done this in either March or April, uh, our Chromebook purchases. And for those that are newer to the board, this is, uh, we purchase a Chromebook for each of the freshman uh, students as they come into Fenton. Uh, it's a Chromebook for just about four years, so that works out well for us, and they, uh, they carry it throughout their uh, time here at Fenton. Um, this year, it just as a forewarning, we're, we're going to bring this to you in April. Uh, these are funded partially with uh, local uh, monies out of my budget and partially out of Title I uh, funding through Michelle's uh, grant funding. Um, this year it's going to be a little different. As you can imagine, prices are increasing. Uh, and this is really the first time that we've seen any, any substantial increase. Since I've been here, we've really only gone up maybe a dollar or two per Chromebook. Uh, this year, we're estimating it's going to be about a 25% increase. Wow. Uh, that's a substantial amount of money. Um, so we feel we're going to be able to handle that within the budget and within Title I funding that, uh, that we have available to us. So I'm not concerned about it from a budget perspective. I just wanted to bring this to your attention before any stick. 
bigger shot than some other people, <laughs> as you know. It's, it's a combination of, you know, there's, there's a lot of chip shortages it's across the board. Uh, what I'm doing and why I originally thought to bring this in March, what I'm doing is some additional due diligence just to make sure that there's no other option for us that will give us the same quality Chromebook without, uh, you know, per, that allows to, to get something at a lower price than what we're being quoted. What we typically do is we get some quotes, but uh, we've been purchasing this for a purchasing co-op uh, uh, contract, if you will, that's been pre-bid uh, through uh, a group that uh, supplies a lot of product to school districts throughout the country. Um, and so we're really comfortable with that. But just because of this, I'm doing a little extra due diligence just to make sure that we're getting the right, the right price. So we'll bring that to you in April. Can, can Does you remind the company it? take any uh, like trade backs or from the ones that we, you know, and well, give you some kind of credit for? That's a that's an interesting question. So what we've done well, with the Chromebooks is a couple of things. One is in the last couple of years we've allowed the seniors to uh, buy them from us basically for a twenty five dollar mm -hmm. or a fairly low price. But at that point in time, that's about what the market value is for those. Um, so they're able to keep that device that they're very comfortable with and, and take it on to college as that's it's a spare device. Uh, it, it'll still be a functional computer uh, at that point. Uh, and then what we do with the rest of them, we hang on to a few for spares. Mm -hmm. We'd like to have a, a stockpile so that the, the student's Chromebook breaks and we have to send it in for repair. They have one they can use in the meantime. And all the remaining ones, we actually uh, sell. So um, uh, three or four months ago, uh, you voted okay. on a disposal list. It was mm -hmm. super long. Yeah. It contained hundreds and hundreds of Chromebooks. That was about two years of, of Chromebooks that we were uh, disposing of. Um, we're not, right now, they're sort of auditing that at the place that, that we sold them to. We will be getting some money back. I don't know what that number is right now. I expect it to be, it could be anywhere from three to, to $8,000, $10,000 for those, you know, five and six year old Chromebooks. So we do get some of that back, so that does help. Can you can you remind us again what was that uh, expenditure last year? The was like what we spent last year. Yeah. It was about one hundred and fifty, just yeah. shy of one hundred and fifty thousand. Um, uh, undoubtedly, just but uh, I'll digress just for a, a few seconds here. When I arrived at Fenton, we were actually leasing these, uh, and so we changed this process where we would actually buy them for the freshmen. Uh, we were actually spending more on leasing every year than than. Uh, what we were buying them for substantially. But it's just a chunk out up front. Yeah. Versus yeah. The so it, it was about 150. It's going to be closer to 190 this year. Um, but I'll have a little bit of some more refined number next year. This, this is the alignment of the budget that we're part of it, is what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it, yes. Yeah. It comes in, goes right out. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Jim. <laughs> 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 thanks, Jim. Next one is summer curriculum hours. Ms. Papa Nicolau. Yeah, sure. Um, and I'll just clarify. Sometimes this this um, topic comes in April. Sometimes it comes in May. We've done a little shifting sometimes of our board meeting, whether it's in the third week or the second week. And, and this topic really hinges on our master schedule being done and our teachers knowing what they're teaching for the following year. So it's looking like it'll be in May. Um, proposal for these. Um, each year, certified staff proposes um, special curricular projects they're, they would like to do over the summer, or sometimes we would like them to do over the summer. Um, and this, this may be associated with new courses, which we saw a lot of new CTE courses in our programs of study, so you'll see some of that. Major course revisions. Um, if there's a new teacher of a course who's never taught that course before, we give them a little bit of time to prep with that material. If there's a new textbook, we give teachers time to associate themselves with the materials and, and um, the tools. So that um, is usually at a rate around $25 an hour. Next year it looks like $26.39 per hour. Um, so after the staff submits all of those, after knowing what they're going to teach, um, we go through that as a leadership team and we approve or disapprove before we even bring it to you and, and ask you for, um, you know, for approval to allow teachers to work on those pro projects and get paid. 
Alongside of that, we also do summer workshops, which is professional development. Um, and that's also brought to you kind of in that same package of the curriculum hours um, at a rate of $20.90 per hour. Um, we'll see some workshops over the summer aligned with personalized learning, grading, equity, things of that nature. We don't have every single one of those options pinned down now, but by May, we'll have some more details for you. How, how many teachers usually? We actually get a lot of teachers who participate because we actually ask them to participate as teams. We really don't want um, teachers working in silos on these projects. So um, if it's a project for English 3, it's all of the English 3 teachers. Um, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. And how many, about how many hours? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, uh, um, I have to go back and look really quick because I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, and I'm looking at Bruce to see if he remembers because it's usually about 20,000, no. I mean, it might be like six hours per month. Yeah, well, we have guidelines within it. So if like they're a new teacher of the course, we'll give them about 10 hours. If it's a new textbook, we'll give them about five hours. If they're designing a whole new course, we're looking at about 15 hours per teacher. So it really depends on how many projects are happening. Okay. Um, but I think it's usually um, in total around 20 to 25,000 okay. for um, all of these. The one year during the pandemic, it was much higher <laughs> yeah. um, because everybody had to go online and make oh. that shift. Um, yeah. So. Um, don't quote me on it, but I'll have you. I'll have very detailed information for you. You'll see I, I break it down by the department, the type of project it is, the hour, and the total for each project, and then the, the total. So I give you a pretty detailed okay. account of everything. Right. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Next uh, informational item in regards to summer is extended employment. Sam. Thank you. So for the SAT, these are something we look at every year. And it's of the summer. So basically, we break it down to certain areas. CTE is a work day, career internship, diet preparation. ELL, we have nine work days for ESL coordinator. Obviously, we move in to getting kids situated for the start of the school year. That is critical. Uh, the counseling department, we get days two for uh, credit checks. Basically, students transferring in transferring out, balancing and sectioning. So we do that, that includes our college and career counselor in that. Uh, link crew mentoring we do also over the summer. And then uh, finally we have a special ed department. We break it down by categories like psychology, social worker, five and four, uh, cooperative education, workplace experiences for students with IEPs. Uh, the nurse, special ed teacher, because we need to have them in any uh, intake meetings, which we want kids to start by the start of the year, so we can take a to do intakes of new students. And then uh, the nurse with her duties and the nurse assistant. So pretty typical year, really nothing out of the ordinary. And the theme between extended employment and curriculum summer hours is basically, if you want to think of it this way, it's preparation for the next school year. What work do we need to get done when the kids get back in the building? Administrators who are 12 months do not have these extended employment as part of our contract. If we work 12 months, we will also take a week to prep for what are the initiative, the strategic plan 2.0 to get that all going. So you, you start cleaning it up at the end of the year. That's exactly what we're doing right now. But you see in March and April and it kicks off in May, hey look, let's start preparing for the following school year. Mm -hmm. So this is what it's all about. The pictures there is the automotive, as Sam was saying, um, wood section. I mean, whether it's the, the saws there that needs um, lubricating and sharpening, as well as the, uh, the lift machines there and the automotives, our folks need to do that. Our folks need to get it prepared and cleaned and, and maintained for the upcoming school year. Are these our, are Those are our pictures, yes. Whose truck is that? <laughs> Who's I think that's Leo's. Leo's, yeah. is that your truck? <laughs> <laughs> is it a Toyota? No, no, it's oh, it's nice one. That one I don't know. <laughs> Sam, is that yours? No. no, 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 no. Okay, no. nice one. I got to look. Sylvia, I found your hours. Oh. If you want them, I can. Okay, yeah. yeah Go ahead, about, Michelle. Yeah. Um, so last year was about eleven hundred hours, um, for a total of about thirty thousand oh. dollars. Sorry, I knew I could find it right away. I just uh. <laughs> The next information item is the Bell Schedule Exploration. 
Michelle? Oh, sure. Um, so this is, like James said, just an exploration of the topic about how we organize our time during the school day. Um, right now, we organize our time with eight periods. Students go from one period to the next. We have a bison time on Tuesday through Friday. We have lunches in there. Um, about the, in May, at the end of our remote learning, um, we sent out a survey to staff and families and students, um, just asking them what, what were some of your key takeaways from your experience. And um, there was a lot of chatter in those comments about how we organize our time at school and how um, it best supports students in developing their learning. So we sat on that a little bit and really contemplated, you know, the effects of um, the pandemic and really um, did that have, you know, how much merit is that <laughs> is there and when you're in a crisis situation and understanding, you know, should we make a shift in our, our scheduling just because of that. Um, so we went back and we had some conversations in February with our staff. Um, now that we're kind of through that and back to normal, <coughs> And we started having some lunch conversations with our staff about our daily schedule and how it's organized. And from there, it does seem that there are some valid points that our staff is making about our instructional time and how we use it and how it might better, in some ways, support students if we look at different parts of um, our bell schedule or how we organize our school day. So from here, because there seems to be the need for more exploration, we are going to start a committee to look at this a little bit further. Um, we're gonna have our first three meetings in April and May. <coughs> we're going to have them in the evenings, so students, parents, and staff can be involved. Um, we're going to research some best practices around organizing <coughs> the school day. We're going to look at some other school models. We're going to talk to some other schools who use different models um, and hear and understand their challenges and you know, the strengths that they see. Um, the areas that we are hearing about from our staff and our students, because we invited students to those conversations as well, um, was really how do we allow time in our school day to allow for more community-based learning opportunities, times exploring careers, time exploring, or. Um, deeper types of learning experiences, maybe with community service or service-based learning involved. You know, that's really hard to do in short periods of time. Um, they're also talking about our systems of support and where our students get support and whether bison time is the most effective or are there other effective models for that. So um, that's what we're starting to talk about. Um, we. We'll see where these conversations go, and I'll update you in June um, and let you know where, that, where those are going. I'm happy if any of you decide to join us, or if you have any interest, I can give you the dates um, and times. Like I said, we'll do it in the evening so we can have um, our families involved. Thanks, Michelle. One second. Go ahead, Pat. No, thanks. Yeah, mm -hmm. Just looking at it. Um, um, what's nice about this whole process, as Michelle described, is we're getting it from all of our stakeholders. Key one are our, our students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Second is our teachers, admin, and now parents. So really looking forward to this. I think the committee is a smart uh, uh, next step um, to put some traction into it and to put some structure uh, into this uh, exploration. So more to come then, Michelle. Yep. Did the pandemic survey uh, reflect like, what was going on in house versus or was it more like their, what they, how they felt about that e-learning? Um, it, it was the combination, because we were in the hybrid at that point. So it was just overall how they felt about their learning at that point yeah. in time. So, you know, we had lots of comments about students. We love the higher level of independence and, mm -hmm. um, and things of that nature. Um, but a lot of um, staff and students and teachers, or I'm sorry, and parents most of their comments had to do with how we organized the school day. So you can imagine we were, we were experiencing that. Um, we all remember that, but um, it's always worth a look to see um, if there's ways to do something better. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Michelle. Our last informational item is just a quick COVID update. Great news here. We've had four cases in the last four weeks, as you can see by the chart there. Really back in January, early January is our spike. It has tapered off. So we're very proud of that. That's the cases. Next one are masks. Mask is optional, as you can see here among us. There are some folks who want to wear masks and some folks who choose not to wear masks. That's the same thing um, in our school district as well. And lastly, testing. Testing is still optional. Um, we used to test approximately 130 uh, individuals uh, every week. It's, it's, it's still offered as optional, but we're averaging about 25, 30 at, at this present moment. So we're going to continue with that trend, uh, with that practice. There's still some cleaning. Um, deep cleaning here every night at, at Fenton. That is it for informational reports. Okay, thank you, James. Uh, next we go to our consent agenda. Uh, looking it over, do we have any questions or comments regarding our consent agenda? That's um, the usual. Mm -hmm. We're good? Okay, then uh, may I have a motion to approve the uh, consent agenda as presented. I'll make that motion. Thank you, John. I'll second. Thank you, Leo. Go ahead. <laughs> Roll call, please. Rago? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Rezinski? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. A? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Pinkopon? Yes. Motion passed. Uh, let's go through our committee reports, starting with the BCF, the Bensonville Community Foundation. Uh, nothing to report. There is a meeting on the 24th. Okay. Uh, the I committee, we have a meeting coming up next month. Yes. Uh, before our, our, our regular board meeting. Uh, board Finance Facilities Committee, we just had that. Don't need to hand hash that, right? We're good? Referendum passed. Yeah. Or we pat, yeah, we, we agreed vote, we to voted. have the referendum. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I give up. Hey, I'm just thinking ahead. All right, these are positive thoughts, positive vibes. All right. I need more caffeine. I'm sorry. That was the referendum passed the board and is going on the ballot. The resolution. Resolution. resolution to approve the referendum. Yeah, I give up. Never mind. I John's, give up. John's gonna put the. Bill. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, John. You I insert for the mouth. To add to that? You're good? No, that's it. Okay, thank you guys. Um, <laughs> thanks, Glenn? Carrie. You got my back, man. I got you back. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> it's like so, seventh inning stretch or something right that's now. That's it, that's it is. Len? Uh, Len, real quick, uh, there was a meeting on May 25th. Um, I provided the board with a report regarding the Len's uh, meeting. In summary, there were 15 new bills in Springfield. So it hasn't been passed, so we'll keep an eye on, on it, and uh, we'll see what happens. Next one is NEDSEC. Um, there was a March meeting uh, that took place on, uh, on Monday. Uh, topics is very similar to ours. It's, uh, in, uh, it included staff planning, honorable dismissal and dismissal, roof replacement at Lincoln Academy, policy revisions. We were way ahead of them. They're still getting through their policies. And uh, classroom lease uh, agreements. Okay. And last is our board policy committee. That's what me and Patty, right? Nothing going on right now with that. No is the updates. Uh, so we'll, we'll announce the next meeting. The next board meeting is Wednesday, April 20th, 2022 at 7 p.m. And then as we talked about, the board, bless you, Sam, uh, board DI committee meeting will take place prior to the regular March board meeting at 6 p.m. Also, uh, we have the ISB Spring DuPage Division dinner meeting. Uh, which is scheduled April 6, 2022 at 5.30. Looks like we're set to have everybody join that evening, mm -hmm. right? Everybody can be so far in attendance. Um, it, it's a 5.30 meeting, so the uh, O bus is leaving at 4.45, is that right? Mary takes to get to Downers Grove North. Okay. 4.45, 4.30. What happened? They told Down. me that. It was down her scroll. 445 should get us there. Thanks, man. Uh, so now we're going to announce the closed session. So may I have a motion and a second to go into closed session for the purpose of the appointment, appoint, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the uh, public body? Um, 
or a uh, legal <laughs> Sorry. I was checking to see if we had anybody here. I could just tell them we're done, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we're good. <laughs> we're good. Um, uh, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee of the public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. However, a meeting to consider an increase in compensation to a specific employee of the public body that is subject to the Local Government Wage Increase Transparency Act may not be closed and shall be open to the public and posted and held accord in accordance with the Act uh, Law 5 Illinois uh, CS 122C1 and collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees of their uh, representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees uh, reflective of um, the Illinois Statute 5 Illinois CS 120 2C2. Uh, again, may I have a, uh, 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 may I have a motion? So, so moved. Second. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Juliet and Leo. Uh, roll call, please. Rago? Yes. Redzinski? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. A? Yes. Gallagher? Yes. Lewis? Yes. King Paul Pong? Yes. Do you want to take a five? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs>